Good morning, everyone. Let's stand up. We're going to sing. I am resolved. I am resolved no longer to linger, charmed by the world's delight. Things that are higher, things that are nobler, these have allured my sight. I will hasten to Him, hasten so glad and free. everybody. Uh, my name's Josh. This is my lovely wife, Katie, and our soon-to-be son, Parker. 
Uh, and we just wanted to take this opportunity to welcome you guys. Uh, really grateful that you guys are here. And we just wanted to share a couple thoughts with you. Uh, you know, in us becoming parents soon, uh, I, I am really excited, but I'm also really scared. And I think that's kind of how it's supposed to be a little bit. I, I feel like I'm as ready as I'm ever going to be, but I'm not ready at all. Uh, and, and I really wrestle uh, so often with this question, am I even worthy to get to be a father? Are we worthy to get to be parents to this uh, son that we are probably going to mess up so many things and how to raise him and all this stuff. Am I worthy? And you know, it, in some respects, yes, I am worthy because God wouldn't have given him to us if, if I wasn't. But in other respects, I'm not worthy. Uh, I'm, I'm lacking and, I, and I'm missing uh, so much of what I need to be the, the best father, what we need to be the, to be the best parents. Uh, but we come this morning to worship someone who truly is worthy. Uh, so we're going to read in, in Revelation chapter 5, uh, and, and so turn there with us if, if you have a Bible or if you want to go on your phones, and we're just going to read a, a snapshot that really says just that, that he truly is worthy. Also, Parker says good morning by some karate kicks with his feet. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so Revelation 5, starting in verse 1, it says... Then I saw in the right hand of him who sat on the throne a scroll with writing on both sides and sealed with seven seals. And I saw a mighty angel proclaiming in a loud voice, Who is worthy to break the seals and open the scroll? But no one in heaven on, or on earth or under the earth could open the scroll or even look inside it. I wept and wept because no one was found who was worthy to open the scroll or look inside. Then one of the elders said to me, Do not weep. See, the lion of the tribe of Judah, the root of David, has triumphed. He is able to open the scroll and its seven seals. Amen. Then I saw a lamb, looking as if it had been slain, standing at the center of the throne, encircled by the four living creatures and the elders. The lamb had seven horns and seven eyes, which are the seven spirits of God sent out into all the earth. He went and took the scroll from the right hand of him, who sat on the throne. And when he had taken it, the four living creatures and the 24 elders fell down before the lamb. Each one had a harp, and they were holding golden bowls full of incense, which are the prayers of God's people. And they sang a new song, saying, You are worthy to take the scroll and to open its seals, because you were slain. And with your blood you purchased for God persons from every tribe and language and people and nation, you have made them to be a kingdom and priests to serve our God, and they will reign on the earth. What a powerful scene, right? As we see, man, there's, there's so much that speaks volumes, but it truly is Jesus Christ who is worthy. He's worthy to take and open that scroll. He's worthy of our worship just as he was worthy of the worship described here. And so as we gather this morning, uh, maybe you're, you're still at home even, Jesus truly is worthy of our worship. So as we sing, there's even a section of this uh, song that we're about to sing that says, worthy is the lamb. He truly is worthy. So let's worship him this morning uh, because he deserves it. And let's exalt him uh, as we, we worship together, not just with our voices, but as we listen. Uh, to those who are sharing communion, contribution, and the sermon. Let's worship a worthy God this morning. Amen? Amen. Amen. Hi, God. Good morning, Father. I'm so grateful for this morning, so grateful for this service, getting to gather together with your people. Father, thank you so much for being the lamb that was slain. Thank you for giving your blood to give us new life, new family, everything that we could ever need from you. I'm so grateful for this. I pray this in your son's holy name. Amen. There's a peace I've come to know. Though my heart and flesh may fail, there's an anchor for my soul. I can say it is well. Jesus has overcome, and the grave is over well. The victory is 
shadows disappear and my faith shall be my eyes Jesus has overcome and the grave is overwhelmed the victory is won he is risen from Good morning, church. My name is Carlos. My wonderful girlfriend, Abby, is coming on stage. And today, we have the honor and privilege of leading our hearts in communion. And so we're just so thankful. Um, and we had it on our hearts to share a scripture from Exodus 16. So if you'll turn with us there, Abby's going to share. Thank you. Okay, can you fix me? Thank you. Um, okay, so first off, just the context of this scripture. Um, the Israelites had just been freed um, from slavery after they'd been enslaved for a very, very long time. Um, and so their mindset on things was kind of stuck in this pattern of oppression um, and suffering and being accused all the time. Like in previous passages, just a couple chapters before this, their Pharaoh is blaming their need to pray to God on their laziness. Um, so they have this voice over them of accusation all of the time. And so even though they've been freed and God's like he did so many things just a couple chapters before to free them um, from Pharaoh and literally like part of the sea <laughs> but um, they have this difficult time with really understanding who God is because of how their lives have been so um, just looking in chapter 16 verses 23 through 27 I'm just going to read that um, Moses said to them, this is what the Lord commanded. Tomorrow is to be a day of Sabbath rest, a holy Sabbath to the Lord. So bake what you want to bake and boil what you want to boil. Save whatever is left and keep it until morning. So they saved it until morning, um, as Moses commanded, and it did not stink or get maggots in it. Eat it today, Moses said, because today is a Sabbath to the Lord. You will not find any of it on the ground today. Six days you are to gather it, but on the seventh day, the Sabbath, there will not be any. Nevertheless, 
Some of the people went out on the seventh day to gather it, but they found none. And now Carlos is just going to share some personal experience. Amen. Thanks, Abby. This scripture is so interesting because it's so easy to, to see them and be like, why don't you just listen, right? But how often can that be us? You know, just thinking about my life, seeing them be told, this day is the Sabbath. This day you're to rest. This day you're supposed to dwell with God. But it says, nevertheless, they went out anyways. Nevertheless, they did what they wanted to do. And it's just so crazy to me how relatable that is. Because for me, my upbringing, like being the oldest brother, being the oldest grandson, like you have all this pressure, I have all this pressure to be perfect, to, to strive for this golden child image. And so how I see love and God's approval is let me earn it. Let me prove that I'm worthy of your love. And I, can, I think that can take away from the whole point of God's grace. You know, we're so focused on earning our salvation that we've completely missed. It's about God's grace. It's not about what we do. It's not about our works. It's just about our hearts to follow God, our hearts to walk with God. And the scripture that came to mind for me was in Colossians chapter 1. Starting verse 21, it says, Once you were alienated from God and were enemies in your minds because of your evil behavior. But now he has reconciled you by Christ's physical body through death to present you holy in his sight, without blemish and free from accusation. I think that's so powerful because it's a reminder that it's not about the works. It's not about all the voices that the world tells us to do all the right things, appear this, uh, in this right image, or, or be perfect. We're not perfect. We're not meant to be perfect. God's perfect. And his love covers our sins, covers our falling shorts, so that we can be reconciled to him. And I wanted to share that this morning because as we take communion, it's important to reflect on that. You know, just thinking about our lives, are we focusing on our relationship with God or are we focusing on doing the right things? And with that, let's go to prayer. Dear Holy Father, I just want to come to you in prayer and say thank you for this beautiful day. Thank you for this opportunity um, to just come to you and learn more about you and to worship you, Lord. I pray as we take the bread and the cup that we can just reflect on our relationships with you, um, that we don't strive to, to earn your love, but that we can be comforted, that we can be secured in knowing that you overlook that. Your grace, your sacrifice, your love overcomes that, and that with your sacrifice, you can view us in this holy light, that we can be reconciled to God and have a relationship with you. So I pray that we can just remember that today, this week, and the rest of our lives. I love you a lot. Praise in your holy name. Amen.
Amen. At this time, I will pray for us in our time of contribution. If you would like to give, there's chalices in the back. You can also give online on our Tithely app, which is on the announcements. Please bow your heads. Dear Heavenly Father, uh, I just want to come back to you in prayer (laughs) and say just thank you for your love, but thank you for all the things that you bless us with. Thank you for opportunities to give, to, to build your kingdom, and to show your love to other people, Lord. I just pray that we can have it on our hearts to to give, that we can be cheerful givers, that we can be sacrificial givers and be bold with our with our giving, Lord, and that you can just continue to work in powerful ways, even if it's just little, Lord. It's about our hearts. So I pray that we can keep that in mind this morning. Amen. Amen. Before we keep going with the worship, I've got some announcements for us. So look at your sheet, uh, if you please. Uh, just a few things to highlight. Uh, so first and foremost, uh, the midweek schedule. Uh, this coming midweek is, oh, it's already going to be February, right? So uh, we are going to have a uh, family group midweek. Uh, it might feel like we had a family group midweek this past Wednesday. That was because of all the snow and winter. So uh, we do have a family group midweek this coming Wednesday. Uh, so Meet with your family groups. And then uh, every Sunday, in case you missed this, at 845, uh, Harold has been teaching Bible class. So make sure if that's something that interests you, uh, that you come if you're available to do that. Uh, We got a couple things coming up. Uh, So this weekend, uh, we're living it right now. Uh, We had most of the men's pool tournament. That was a great time yesterday. Uh, And so we have our two representatives, and we'll tell you guys next week who wins the whole thing, all right? So, uh, yeah. Uh, And then also today, we've got uh, my wife, Katie Werner's uh, baby shower. Uh, So that's this afternoon. It's in the the bottom right corner. All women preteen and up are invited to that, but please RSVP about it, okay, so they know you're coming. Uh, And then coming up, uh, just a couple weekends from now, we have our marriage retreat. It's in Branson, Missouri, and it's going to be an awesome time. Uh, Bill and Kristen Molden are going to be our guest speakers. It's going to be so great to to be with your uh, spouse during that. Please register by tomorrow. Tuesday is too late uh, for the, the better rates for the rooms. So you can still register and do all that, but it will be a little bit more expensive for the rooms themselves. And then also that same weekend, we have our singles uh, retreat. So that will be awesome. That's in Kansas City. So lots of things coming up. Uh, I do just have one more announcement, and that is uh, just a prayer request for Atara. Uh, So she is going through a very difficult time, had a very difficult uh, surgery and, and complications because of that stuff. Uh, I don't know if technically it was a surgery. All the same, she is uh, in desperate need of our prayers. So we're actually going to pray for her right now uh, because it's, it's a very dire situation. So uh, Heavenly Father, we just pray that you be with Atara, uh, that you help her to heal, uh, that you make your presence felt with her and with uh, her family. Uh, and we just pray that we can be family for her. Uh, that we can keep her in our hearts, keep her in our prayers moving forward. And Father, that you can just do incredible things in her life, uh, helping her to, to heal from all this stuff. And, and Father, to, to just uh, be able to, to come back to us and, and that we can worship together again. So we love you so much, Father, and we pray uh, that you can work powerfully in her situation. Pray all this in your son's name. Amen. Amen. Let's stand. We're going to have one more song before our lesson this morning. We need you now. We need your fire within. We need your love. We need you as our friend. We need your light to guide through what's ahead. We need you now. We need you now. The Spirit, Spirit, fire. Your power made this universe. 
Jesus we see your power save our lives and set us free your power's here among us as we see your everything your everything the spirit spirit almighty flame Give us the dream, and when the dream is done, we'll be with you, we'll be with you. Please be seated. Good morning. Good morning. Welcome once again to Heartland Church. It is just uh, always good to be together. And I uh, missed you guys on Wednesday night. Hopefully you had some great time with your family or just by yourself really reflecting on the book of Acts as we've been studying out. And I wanted to start off just giving a thank you to the Ozans. Uh, Steve and Bev uh, led a parenting class for us yesterday. And so uh, thank you guys for doing that. Of course, you know their son, Ben Ozan, who's out of town today. But uh, just got some great nuggets of wisdom. And if you missed it, we do have it recorded. So if you're a parent or a future parent and you would like to hear uh, the class, let us know and we'll get that to you. Um, also yesterday, as Josh mentioned, we had our pool tournament, our men's pool tournament that benefited Hope, our, our food pantry, and I wanted to give you guys an update. Um, today we have the finals, okay? So we had two locations, and the winners of each location are coming together after church to play the finals. So the, uh, the guys in the finals are Heath and Cody. Where are you guys at? There's Heath right there. Cody's practicing up right now, I guess, for the tournament. And then uh, the, other, the other finalists were Harold and Steve. So Harold's back there. Steve is wandering around somewhere here. He was just playing keyboard. Um, and, and I understand Steve really pulled you guys through. Is that right, Harold? <laughs> Steve actually had to leave before their first game. So Harold played all of it. Um, but Steve will play today, and we'll see how that goes for you guys. But, uh, you know, we've been studying out the book of Acts, the Acts of the Apostles. And uh, last week, we kind of did an intro and overview. So if you didn't get to hear the lesson last week, please go on our website and go through it because there's a lot of really pertinent information that really helps us to understand the book of Acts. But we're, we're breaking down the book of Acts into six sections. And uh, today, we're going to be talking about the birth of the early church, the birth of the early church. So today, we're going to be covering Acts 1 through Acts 6, verse 7. So a lot of stuff that we're covering today. And uh, this is probably the most rich section in the book of Acts, I believe. Because later on in Acts, there's a lot of stories and different things, but there's so much teaching and so much happened in these first few chapters that we're going to be doing today. So put on your seatbelt, because we're going to be moving today and covering a lot of ground and talking about a lot of things. 
But again, if you missed last week, please go back and listen to that intro and overview because it really lays the foundation for what else we're going to be talking about. We also talked about last week of putting on our first century glasses. Remember that? If we look at the scriptures in, in 21st century lenses, sometimes we miss some things, right? Because who was the audience? Who were the people? What was the message that they were trying to get through? And what was the context? And so put on your first century glasses today. Now, we, we talked about at the beginning of Acts, it's broken down not so much into chapters. We, we have it in chapters in our Bible. But really, Luke, when he wrote it, he, he kind of put it into these six different sections. Each section concluded with, with a line that kind of told the update on what was going on in the church. But he starts off with this theme scripture in Acts 1.8. He says, but you will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes on you, and you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem and in all Judea and Samaria and to the ends of the earth. And that really does set the tone for Acts. What we're going to see in Acts is this scripture lived out. That the early disciples were going to be his witnesses in Jerusalem. Okay, that's what we're going to look at today. And then in all Judea and Samaria and to the ends of the earth. So this really does set up the entire book of Acts. And, you know, the book of Acts, it gives us about the first, uh, or what we're going to look at today is about the first five to ten years of what the early church was like and what they were going through. And there's so much information in this section. If you think about it, it's kind of like the beginning of the Bible in Genesis. Those first few chapters in Genesis, they introduce us to man. They introduce us to God and in his creation and kind of what he sets forth, what he sets in motion for the rest of the Bible. We see there in Genesis 1 through 11. Well, in Acts 1 through 6, we kind of see the rest of the New Testament. After the Gospels, we see what's going to happen from here forward in the church. And so what we're going to do, we're going to start off today, I'm just going to give you guys a summary of each chapter. Okay, we're not going to read all six chapters because we're going to be here till three. Um, but I want to give a summary of each chapter, and then we're going to go back and hit two very specific topics that we see in this section. You guys with me? All right. Um, if you have a Bible, uh, get it out. And if you have a notebook, you might want to write some notes down. If not, we're recording this, so you can always go back and, and follow up again. Chapter one. Okay? These are just some key highlights in the first six chapters. Chapter 1, the disciples are apart from Jesus for the first time. Okay? Remember, he called the 12 and he sent them out and different things, but this is really the first time that they're out on their own apart from Jesus. He's now ascended into heaven. And, and, but before he did that, he spent an extra 40 days talking to them about the kingdom of God. We don't know exactly everything he said in those 40 days, but you can imagine all that we learn in the Gospels. Jesus is like, I got 40 more days to spend with these guys, right? And then he launches them out. So this is the first time that they're on their own. Um, there were about 120 living in Jerusalem, okay? So the whole church, oh, the whole thing was right there in Jerusalem, about 120 people that started off. And this is really important. They appointed a new apostle, okay? Remember Judas died, right? So Judas is no longer there with them, one of the 12. So they appoint this guy named Matthias, okay? Now, one thing I want to point out, and if you read through this, you'll see this. Um, it, they said that if, if someone's going to be an apostle, they had to be a witness with us of Jesus, okay? That's very important um, because it didn't set up the succession like, okay, there's going to be, when these guys die, there's going to be some more apostles and more. The, the qualification, one of the qualifications was they had to be there with Jesus, now, this word for apostle, the actual word is the same word that we use for martyr, okay? So it was martyrio in the Greek, and it, mean, it literally means they were a witness or they were a martyr, okay? And all of the apostles, except John, and John we don't know for sure, but we believe he wasn't martyred, but all the other apostles ended up being martyred for their faith, okay? So that's what we see starting off here in, in chapter 1. Chapter 2, the Holy Spirit comes down onto the 12, okay? This is a big moment. Jesus said, wait here, and I will send a counselor. I will send the Holy Spirit to you. Uh, one thing to note about this is they didn't do anything to get the Holy Spirit here, okay? The Holy Spirit, it just happened to them. They're all in the room, they're praying, and the Holy Spirit comes down. It wasn't like they said, okay, God, send us the Holy Spirit now. He said, wait, and it will happen to you. And that's what we see happening. Um, Peter Remember what Jesus gave to Peter? He said, I give you the keys 
to the kingdom. Here we see Peter preaching this sermon, really fulfilling six to eight hundred year old prophecies about the coming of the kingdom. He calls people to repent and be baptized. Okay, we'll get into this more in a minute. Um, they added 3,000 to their number in one day. Okay, we've seen some baptisms right here, right? But we've never seen 3,000 in one day. But that was the start here, that was the birth of the early church. And after that, it talks about that the Lord added to their number daily those who were being saved. So that's chapter two, okay? We're going to jump into that a little bit more here in a minute. Chapter three, Peter and John heal a beggar who couldn't walk, okay? We've seen Jesus healing people. We saw the apostles do a little bit of stuff in the gospels, but now they heal this man that couldn't walk. Peter preaches another sermon about who Jesus was, and then we see this crowd start to gather and an uproar starts happening, okay? There, there's kind of this, this stuff going on, right? Things are bubbling up and they're questioned. Chapter 4, we see the first persecution of Christians after Jesus is gone. We see these men get jailed for speaking about Jesus. We see now the church grows to over 5,000 men, is what we're told, which historians think is probably about 10,000 people now in the church. So imagine in, a, in just a few days' time going from 120 to 10,000 disciples. This is an amazing time in the church. Um, they also take up a special contribution or an offering, and Barnabas sells the field and gives that money to, to the church. Amen? So that's chapter 4, just a summary. Chapter 5, okay? Now it gets a little bit uh, hairier here. Ananias and Sapphira. You guys remember the story of Ananias and Sapphira? And they, they saw what Barnabas did, and they said, hey, we're going to do this too. We're going to give this money to God. But then what they did is they kind of held some of it back for themselves and, and lied about it, which, okay, don't do that. Don't lie. Um, so there was deceit in the church. And, and, you know, they're called out, and Peter says, you've lied not only to, to us, but to the Holy Spirit. Okay, so it's this intense moment in the church. Um, and it, it's dealt with severely, okay? They actually die right there. They, they, first, uh, Ananias falls over, and then his wife falls over dead. And so it's a pretty intense moment here in the early church. Um, and then we see more miracles, and we see more persecution. And in fact, they're severely beaten for speaking about Jesus. And then finally, in Acts chapter 6, verses 1 through 7, they have this situation that comes up where these widows are being overlooked and there's some needs going on. And so they appoint these seven men to, to really be what we, we would call now as deacons, right? They were just in charge of overseeing some things so that the apostles could focus on preaching the gospel and prayer, okay? So that's a whole lot of stuff. That's five years worth of stuff that we just kind of summarized in a few verses there. Uh, but now what I want to do is we're going to dive into two very important practices that the early church had. Two focuses that we see throughout these first few chapters, and we see it over and over and over. So specifically today, we're going to be talking about conversion and devotion. Okay, conversion and devotion. So let's start with conversion. We're going to jump back. Remember who wrote the book of Acts was Luke. Okay, so we're going to go back to the book of Luke for just a moment. <clears throat> In Luke 24, verse 46 through 49, he says, The Messiah will suffer and rise from the dead on the third day. Okay, that has happened. And repentance for the forgiveness of sins will be preached in his name to all nations beginning at Jerusalem. You are witnesses of these things. I am going to send you what my father has promised, but stay in the city until you have been clothed with power from on high. You know, this is so cool because it's exactly what happened. Luke prophesies this. Luke puts it out there, or, or J Jesus, rather, is saying this, and, and it's exactly what happened. Jesus dies, raised from the dead. Repentance for the forgiveness of sins will be preached, beginning where? In Jerusalem. And he says, and wait, because you will receive power from on high. The Holy Spirit is going to come upon you guys. Of course, in Acts 2, we won't read it for time's sake, but in Acts 2, 1 through 13, that's when the Holy Spirit comes down. And they start speaking in these other languages, and tongues of fire come and rest on these guys. In Acts 2, 14 through 24, Peter stands up, 
and he preaches this sermon. He preaches a sermon all about Jesus. And if you think about it, these were all Jews, or there might have been a few Gentiles, but for the most part, it was all Jews there, and they were hearing about who Jesus was. They've been waiting hundreds, thousands of years for a Savior, and now is the moment. Now is the moment that they hear Jesus preached about. Peter shares prophecies from Joel. He shares from the Psalms, from things that David wrote. But all this is coming to fruition right now in Acts chapter 2. And so what we're going to do is we're going to pick it up in verse 36. Okay, So Peter preaches this incredible sermon about who Jesus was. And then he says this. Therefore, let all Israel be assured of this. God has made this Jesus, whom you crucified, both Lord and Messiah. When the people heard this, they were cut to the heart and said to Peter and the other apostles, Brothers, what shall we do? Peter replied, Repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ, for the forgiveness of your sins. And you will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. The promise is for you and your children and for all who are far off, for all whom the Lord our God will call. With many other words, he warned them and he pleaded with them, save yourselves from this corrupt generation. Those who accepted his message were baptized and about 3,000 were added to their number that day. And this is an incredible moment. The birth of of the early church. And we're going to break down exactly what did Peter say here? And how does this apply to us? What, what, what does this have to do with us now? Okay. So backing up here, and I kind of highlighted some sections, and we'll just kind of break it down verse by verse. But he says, therefore, let all Israel be assured of this. God has made this Jesus, whom you crucified, both Lord and Messiah, or both Lord and Christ. What was his message? That Jesus died, was crucified, and raised again. And that this Jesus, he says, you crucified. Now, does that mean all those 3,000 people physically crucified Jesus? No. Clearly, he's talking about their sin, right? He's saying he died for your sin. Your sin put Jesus on the cross. This message is the same for us today. That when we see the death Burial, resurrection of Jesus. We say, okay, why? What, what happened? It, it's my sin that put Jesus on the cross. It's your sin that put Jesus on the cross. And, and we see their response, okay? Their response wasn't, wow, well, that's great. That's some great religious speak there. What does it say their response was? When the people heard this, they were cut to the heart and said to Peter and the other apostles, brothers, what shall we do? Cut to the heart. You know, perhaps you can think back to a moment in your life when you really got for the first time what your sin did to Jesus. You were cut to the heart. You're like, what what do I do? Tell me, what do I need to do? I'll do whatever. The, The guilt that we felt, the responsibility that we felt. Now, let me be clear. God doesn't want us to continue to feel guilt, right? That's why Jesus died. That's why we take communion to remind us our sins have been forgiven. But we've got to understand the responsibility like they did. And they were cut to the heart. And their response was, what shall we do? You know, we see this heart that we also see in 2 Corinthians 7 where it talks about godly sorrow versus worldly sorrow. Right? Worldly sorrow is, oh, okay, I don't really want to deal with my life, deal with my sins, whatever. Godly sorrow is, hey, let's deal with it. Man, here I am. What do I need to do? Here's all my cards on the table. Let's get this dealt with. That was their response. They were eager to see justice done. Eager to clear themselves. And then you say, okay, what should they do? What shall we do? Peter tells them. Peter replied, repent and be baptized. Every one of you in the name of Jesus Christ for the forgiveness of your sins. So he tells them two things. Okay, repent. The Greek word metanoia literally means to change your mind, to to change the way you think, okay? Another way to look at repentance is you do a 180, okay? You're heading this way, you realize this is not the right way, you don't veer off a little bit, you do a 180 and you head the opposite direction. You head away from sin into a relationship with God. 
So he says, you got to repent. And then he says, and be baptized. Okay? This word baptism, it's actually a transliteration. Okay? That's a fancy word for saying they didn't have that word. And so they, at one point, actually years and years later, they made a new word called baptism. Literally what this word means is to immerse. To immerse. He says you need to repent and be immersed for the forgiveness of your sins. Um, so this word, for, for the Jews, this wasn't an uncommon thing, okay? We saw John the Baptist. Remember, he went around baptizing people for a, a baptism of repentance for the forgiveness of sins. We'll talk about that in a minute. Um, so this wasn't a new concept to them, but now he says to be baptized, to repent and be baptized for the forgiveness of sins. Now, I want to share about this word for, okay? So it's a little word for. The Greek word there is eis, okay? It's E-I-S, basically, eis. And, and what it means is so that, okay? Sometimes people take this word and they kind of try to twist it into something else and say, oh, get baptized because of forgiveness of sins. It literally says, for the forgiveness of sins. We see the exact same word in Luke 3.3 3, when John the Baptist was baptizing people. It says that he gave them a baptism of repentance for the forgiveness of sins, okay? Um, so that's what he says here. And then he also says, and you will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. When you do this, when you repent, when you're baptized, you will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. Now, who is this for? Was this for those 3,000 people that were there that day? Is this for people years later? Let's read it and see. In verse 39, the promise is for you and your children and for all who are far off, for all whom the Lord our God will call. I don't know if you remember last week we talked about how in Acts we see uh, commands, we see teachings, and we see examples, right? We see these different things, and we can't always obey an example. We can learn from examples, but we can't always obey that. We can learn from teachings, but commands are, are things that we are to obey, right? This isn't just a command. This is a universal command. He says this is for you, your children, for all who are far off. In fact, it's for all whom the Lord our God will call. So, so this was a huge thing. This was a brand new teaching that they had. Now that Jesus has died and raised again, now you're to be baptized into the name of Jesus. How did they respond? Let's see. It says, those who accepted his message were baptized, and about 3,000 were added to their number that day. So how did they respond? Some didn't, right? It says those who accepted his message were baptized. We don't know how many were there that didn't accept the message. But what we know is 3,000 of our brothers and sisters were there that day. They heard this message about Jesus dying for them, about their sins putting Jesus on the cross. They accepted the message and were baptized. Now, we're going to get into this, this concept of conversion a little bit more because this is so important. And this is where Luke first introduces this theme of New Testament Christianity, right? How to enter the kingdom. And so in this first time that he introduces it, he goes to great lengths to explain exactly how it was going to happen, right? They already heard the message, so they already heard the word, and they, they believed it because they said, hey, what, what, brothers, what shall we do, right? And then he says, repent and be baptized. So we see this this. I don't want to call it a formula, but the sequence of things that happen here for someone to become a Christian. They need to hear the word. Once they hear it, they got to believe it, right? Then they got to repent. They've got to commit. They've got to make Jesus their Lord, and they've got to be baptized. So throughout Acts, we'll see this message being preached to different groups at different times. And sometimes we only hear them say to be baptized. Okay, we'll look at some of these examples. Sometimes he only tells them to repent. Other times he says, you got to believe. And so he kind of hits people with where they're at, depending on what's going on in their life. And let me give you an example of what I'm talking about here. How many of you guys have been to Little Rock? Anybody not been to Little Rock? Okay, I'm talking to you guys, all right? So if, if you came up here right now, all you non-Little Rock visiting people came up and you said, you ask uh, Steve, you said, hey, how do you get to Little Rock, Steve? Well, if you're, if you're right here in this room, Steve's going to say, well, you want to go out to 412, you want to head up and go east, okay, go to 49, you're going to go south on 49 all the way down to Alma, 
Then you're going to hit 40. And then you're going to head east on 40, and that will take you to Little Rock. Would you say those are accurate directions? Okay. Now, if someone was in Fayetteville, okay, and they come up to Steve... He's not going to tell him to get on 412, right? He's not going to say, go up to Tiny Town and get on 412. He's, he's going to say, hey, head south on 49 to Alma, and then you want to head east, and that will take you to, on Highway 40, head east, and that will take you to Little Rock, right? Now, if we're down where John and Johnetta live in Fort Smith, and somebody says, hey, how do I get to Little Rock? They're not going to say, go get on 412, and then get on 49, and then head east. They're just going to say, jump on 40, head straight east, and that will take you to Little Rock. Is that correct? You guess? <laughs> Have you never been to Little Rock? We, we got to go to Little Rock, all right? Let's, we'll take a road trip. We'll go down there. I'll show you the way. <laughs> but, but here's the point. All of these are accurate directions to Little Rock, but all of them are dependent on where the, the, the person on the journey starts from, okay? So that's what we see so often in the New Testament, and specifically in Acts, is... People are on a different journey. Sometimes Paul or Peter, they encounter people who already have faith in God. Maybe they already believe in Jesus, but they've never repented of their sins. And they've never been baptized. Maybe he encounters someone that believes and they have faith and, and they've repented, but they yet need to be baptized. And so he's going to tell them to do that. Other people, they don't have any issue being baptized or repenting. They just didn't even know they needed to believe. And so he tells them to believe. And so let's look at some examples throughout the book of Acts of this, okay? <clears throat> Acts 2. We just read it. This is the first time so we get this thorough explanation of how one is to be saved. Amen? In Acts 3, Peter's addressing some stubborn Jewish people here, okay? And he just says, you guys need to repent and turn to God. They already believed. They'd already heard the message. He, he didn't need to tell them to have faith. They had faith. They just needed to repent. That was their issue, okay? Repent and turn to God. In Acts 16, the Philippian jailer, this guy was a pagan. He didn't know about, oh, he knew of God maybe, but he didn't really believe, right? So he calls him to believe. That was the focus for this guy. You got to believe. And of course, then it, later it says that him and his household were baptized, right? Acts 17, Paul is preaching to the Athenians. They had this background of idolatry and polytheism, right? They had many gods. And so he primarily talks to them about believing in the one true God, right? He, he meets them where they're at, and that was the focus. It'd be like if we studied with someone that was an atheist today. We wouldn't focus on all these other things. We're just like, we got to teach them about Jesus, right? I, I've shared before, I studied with a, a guy from China one time. He didn't believe in God. So you know what we did? We just read through the Gospels. Until he got to a point where he believed in Jesus. I could have told him to repent. He's like, for what? For who? We'll be baptized. What's that? For who? He needed just faith. He needed to, to believe. And that's what we see in Acts 17. Acts 18. Apollos, okay? He was confused on one issue, and that was baptism. He believed. He had faith. He'd apparently repented. But his issue was he'd been baptized in a different kind of baptism, the, the baptism of John, right? John the Baptist. So that's what he was told to do. Acts 19, the disciples on the road to Ephesus, it was similar to Apollos. There, there was a focus on them being baptized because that's what they needed. And then finally in Acts 22, Paul himself, okay, he recounts his story. And what was told to him was get up, be baptized, and wash your sins away, calling on his name, okay? We see that later Paul references that calling on his name in Romans 10. Uh, but Paul, at that moment, he didn't need to, to believe. He already believed. He didn't need to repent because he'd been wandering around for three days blind, okay? Jesus literally met him face to face on the road, right? What he needed at that moment was to be baptized to wash his sins away, calling on the name of Jesus. So again, we see these different scenarios and just meeting people where they're at. But what's really important and what we can tend to do is we can take one verse out of context. And you, this is dangerous. You can take any verse out of context and make it say whatever you want it to say. We've got to look at the entirety of the scriptures, okay? We've got to look at the whole picture. And when you really see the whole picture, it's beautiful. And God paints the picture incredibly. Um, 
You know, I, I had another experience I was going to share with you. I, I was studying the Bible with this young man one time, and very religious man, okay? He'd grown up going to a church, and very religious, had gone on mission trips even, and done a lot of things, but there were some things that, that he just didn't know about in the Bible. And so we got to the point where we were talking about him being baptized, and he's like, well, you don't need to be baptized. And I was like, well, you do. You know, the Bible says that we do. And, and he said, you didn't. And, and he goes, no, my youth pastor, I talked to him last night, and this is what he said. He said, Galatians 3.26 says, so in Christ Jesus, you are all children of God through faith. And he said, there it is. All you need is faith to be a child of God. And, and I said, I agree with you. You do need faith to be a child of God. I said, read the rest of the sentence. And so we read the rest of the sentence. So in Christ Jesus, you are all children of God through faith. For all of you who were baptized into Christ have clothed yourselves with Christ. And it was amazing because it was literally like scales fell from his eyes. And he goes, I never saw that. I was so focused on this other thing that I didn't see the whole picture. And, of course, shortly after that, he was baptized, and it was, it was amazing. But, but guys, we got to look at the entirety of the Scriptures. Amen? Okay, so a couple last things on this, because this is what the Bible says about how one becomes a Christian, but, but the re religious world, there's so many different teachings out there, right? And, and there's so many different thoughts and ways to go, and I grew up in a church that didn't teach this. They taught some of this, but not all of this, right? Uh, maybe you grew up in a situation like that, or maybe you, you're in a situation like that now. Uh, but there's a few things that I think we've got to do when it comes to the Scriptures, especially with something as important as, as salvation, the first thing is to be obedient. Jesus said in John 14, if you love me, you will obey my commands. Okay, It's not up to me to decide what I want to obey and what I don't want to obey from the scriptures. It's not up to you to, to pick and choose what you want to obey from the scriptures. If you believe in Jesus with all your heart, then you're going to obey Jesus. So you got to ask, have I repented of my sins? Have I committed to the lordship of Jesus? Have I made not Jesus my Savior, but my Lord and Savior? And have you been baptized as an adult for the forgiveness of your sins? You know, if you showed me in the Bible today that I needed to eat Brussels sprouts every Tuesday at noon to be saved, guess what I'm doing Tuesday at noon? By 11.45, I'm cooking the, I don't know how long it takes to cook them, but I'm going to cook up those Brussels sprouts or I'll have Nora cook them for me maybe, but I'm going to do it. Because it's not up to me to question what the scripture says. It's up to me to be obedient. Amen? Again, I'm not saying we can't have questions. We don't wrestle with things. But at the end of the day, we got to do what Jesus said. Amen? The second thing when it comes to, to our doctrine and, and salvation is we need to be confident. Okay? Matthew 7, 14 says, Small is the gate and narrow the road that leads to life, and only a few find it. Okay? Jesus predicted not everybody's going to find the narrow road. It's a narrow road, right? Our, our world today wants to tell us everybody's good. We're all on this big road together. And everybody, if, you just, if you're a good person, you know, you're going to be fine. If you, if you do some nice things, you're going to be fine. That's not what the Bible says, right? It says that the road is narrow and only a few find it. Are you teaching the truth to others? Guys, there's... According to the scriptures, there's a lot of people, most people aren't on this narrow road. Do we have a conviction about helping others to find it? Are we confident in what we believe that we can help others to find the narrow road? Ask yourself, am I well versed in the scriptures? Well, no, I thought that was your job. Well, it is my job, but it's also your job. It's my job to make sure that you're equipped and well versed, right? Here's some statistics from our, our world today come, when it comes to Bible literacy, okay? It used to be that most people in America owned a Bible. Most people in America read the Bible. Most people in America went to church, right? Today, only 20% of Americans say they've read the entire Bible at least once. It means one in five people that you come in contact with at your job, in your family, everywhere, one in five have maybe read the Bible through. Now, maybe Northwest Arkansas, the number's a little higher, right, because it's a Bible belt, but, but it's still not great. Only 22% of Americans read the Bible every day. Again, one in five read the Bible every day. 
One third of Americans have never read the Bible on their own. One third have never read the Bible on their own. 52% say that good deeds will get them to heaven. Man, that's just not true. None of us are good enough to get to heaven. That's why Jesus died. That, that's changing the whole gospel, saying that our good deeds will get us to heaven. But 52% of our country believes that. 45% say that there are many ways to get to heaven. Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. That's not very popular today, right? You, you go out and you start putting that out there, people are going to get offended. Well, are you saying Jesus is the only way? Well, that's what Jesus said. You saying that this other way is not good? Well, that's what Jesus said. We either believe it or we don't, right? It's so important that we know the scriptures, that we're confident in what the scriptures say so that we can help others. So be obedient, be confident. And the last thing I want to say, oh, one, one more thing with that is I want to give you guys a challenge. If you don't have your Bible with you today, I'm not going to point you out, okay? Bring your Bible to church. You know, there's nothing like actually getting in the scriptures. If it's on your phone, that's okay too. But, but have a Bible, right? Take it with you. How are you going to know the Bible if you don't have a Bible with you? You wouldn't go into battle without your sword. Don't go into battle in this world or anywhere without your, your Bible, your sword. Amen? So, so be obedient, be confident. And the last thing on this I want to say is don't be arrogant. Okay? We're not the judge. Okay, we can be confident in what the scriptures say, but it doesn't mean we're self-righteous or we go around judging other people. In fact, we're not the judge, but the word is the judge, right? John 12, Jesus said, that very word which I spoke will condemn on the last day. We need to preach. We need to share. We need to at times warn people. We need to plead with people. But, but we don't look down on people. We don't badmouth people. We don't condescend to people, okay? We're not here to be self-righteous and hypocrites, right? The, the Pharisees, we, we see that in them. God forbid we become the Pharisees, amen? We got to teach the truth in love. So when it comes to this uh, topic of conversion, okay, of salvation, I've got a couple great resources that if you want them, text me your email address, okay? Um, text me your email address. If you don't have my number, get it after church. I will send you, there's one called Born of Water, okay? And it's a very thorough, it's, I don't know, maybe even 50 to 100 pages of just talking about the scriptures that, that talk about baptism and, and all the teaching on that. Um, then there's another um, text that I could send you, and it's the history of the sinner's prayer, okay? A very popular teaching today is, hey, you just pray Jesus in your heart. Just say a prayer, and it forgets about repentance, forgets about baptism. doesn't even really talk about belief, right? It's just say a prayer, and you'll be saved. And, and where did that come from, okay? So I, I can give you some history on that if you want that. Text me your email address. I'll send you those two things. But let me just close this section with this. When you take the scriptures in context, it becomes very clear what the early church taught and practiced. And that's what we need to practice and teach today. Amen? The other area from Acts uh, chapters 1 through 6 that I want to talk about today is the devotion of the disciples. So we talked about what they believed on salvation. Now we're going to talk about their devotion, okay? Acts 2 and verse 42 says, They devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching and to the fellowship, to the breaking of bread and to prayer. Everyone was filled with awe at the many wonders and signs performed by the apostles. All the believers were together and had everything in common. They sold property and possessions to give to anyone who had need. Every day they continued to meet together in the temple courts. They broke bread in their homes and ate together with glad and sincere hearts, praising God and enjoying the favor of all the people. And the Lord added to their number daily those who were being saved. You think, okay, what did it look like? What, what was their lifestyle like in that early church? And then we got to say, okay, does that what our church looks like? Do we look like what Jesus intended his church to look like? Would they go back to their old way of life after this first initial time with, with the apostles there? Would they emulate and imitate the life of Jesus on a daily basis? Would their relationships with one another just be the same as they were in the world? Or would they look different now that they were in Christ? And so here in Acts 2, 42-47, we see this great view of the early Christian's life. 
We see a great view of the first church in Jerusalem. And, and I think it'd be hard to come up with a better way to describe them than devoted. Devoted. What areas do we as individuals need to be more devoted? Devoted to God. Devoted to one another. Devoted to the scriptures. Devoted to prayer. What areas can we grow in as a church in this way? So we're going to look at a few different things that they were specifically devoted to. Okay, there's three different things. The first one is their devotion to prayer. <clears throat> devotion to prayer. And I've got a couple examples here that we'll just we'll go through pretty quickly. Um, the first one is in Acts 1, 14. Okay, before, before Peter even preached, it says, They all joined together constantly in prayer, along with the women and Mary, the mother of Jesus, and with his brothers. Here we see that they were constantly in prayer. Does that describe us? That we're constantly in prayer. You know, I appreciate this morning, Josh, just praying for Atara. Man, when needs come up, we need to pray, right? Throughout our day, are we constantly in prayer? When, when difficult situations come up or diff difficult conversations, when we're having trouble with our kids or maybe we hit a bump with our spouse, are we constantly in prayer? Acts 1, 24 and 25 says, Then they prayed, Lord, you know everyone's heart. Show us which of these two you have chosen to take over this apostolic ministry which Judas left to go where he belongs. Here we see specific prayers, okay? They didn't just pray, God bless everybody today. God, thank you for the food. I mean, they had some specific prayers. This was a big deal. They were appointing a new apostle, so they prayed specifically, Lord, show us. Give us the answer, God. Do you pray specific prayers and wait on God? For the answer. In Acts 2, 42, we read this already. It says, They devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching, to the fellowship, to the breaking of bread, and to prayer. Literally says, they devoted themselves to prayer. Uh, we, we won't read this for time's sake, but in Acts 4, uh, 23 through 31, this is when they started to face some persecution, okay? They, they had a lot of oppression coming at them, and, and they pray this prayer when they were just in a dire situation, okay? I've got the scripture there, but we're gonna, you can read that on your own. Um, so they prayed specific prayers for God to help them. And actually, in spite of all the persecution, one of the things they prayed was, God, help us to be bold. They didn't shrink back. They're like, God, help us to speak even more than what we're already doing. So we see their devotion when they were in dire situations, devoted to prayer. Acts 6, three through four, it says, brothers and sisters, choose seven men from among you who are known to be full of the Spirit and wisdom. We will turn this responsibility over to them, and we will give our attention to prayer and ministry of the Word. They were focused on prayer. They, were, they had a devoted focus on prayer. This was the situation I talked about earlier. There were some needs with the widows in the church, and it, instead of getting all tied up in that, they said, hey, you guys take care of that. We're going to be devoted and focused on prayer. And then finally, we see them praying for these deacons that they appointed. It says, they presented these men to the apostles who prayed and laid their hands on them. You know, when they sent people out to do things, when they appointed people or assigned people to do things, they, they prayed for those people specifically. Are we devoted to prayer? We see it over and over again in the scriptures. We see it over and over in the book of Acts. They were constantly praying. They prayed together. They raised their voices. They prayed for direction from God. They prayed during hardship. They prayed during new ventures. They prayed for the leadership. They prayed with boldness. They prayed for guidance. And they saw miracles. Heartland Church. If it were to be written about us today, the book of Acts were to be written. The Acts of Heartland Church. Would it be said they were devoted to prayer? The next thing we see, they were devoted to partnership. Devoted to partnership. And I just put these scripture references here, so there's a lot of scripture there. So if you want to write those down, you can. Um, but I'll, I'll share a few of these passages with you. You know, in John 13, 34 and 35, Jesus said, A new command I give you, love one another as I have loved you, and so all men will know that you are my disciples. 
How will the world know that you're his disciple? By your devotion to one another, your love for one another. And that's what we see in the early church. Acts 2.42, the first one there, that's where it says they were devoted to the fellowship, to the breaking of bread and to prayer. You know, when you hear about things going on in the church, there's a baby shower, there's a pool tournament, there's, there's different things going on, we're having family group. Are, are you devoted to, to the fellowship? Are you like, yeah, I'm there. And things come up, right? Things can come up and we, can, we have something going on, a work event or whatever, but, but is, it, is it uncharacteristic that you're not there when the body is together? Because you're devoted to partnership. In verse 44 through 47, as we read earlier, it says they were all there. They were together. They had everything in common. They shared with one another. They gave to anyone as they had need. They continued to meet together daily, and they ate together. I like that last part, they ate together. That's a good one. <laughs> but, but it's just this partnership. You know, Church is not something we do on Sunday. It's, it's, it's family. It's we're living life together. We have a partnership that we're doing this together. In Acts 4, 32 and 34, it talks about they were one in heart and mind. They shared everything, and there was no needy person among them. They were truly a family. You know, I think it's sad today that, that so many churches in the world aren't family. They're organizations, right? And again, I don't say this in, in judgment or anything, but, but we got to make sure that we don't become an organization, right? We don't just become a gathering or a social group, that we are really family like Jesus called us to be. Chapter 5, 1 through 11 there, that's where this situation with Ananias and Sapphira happened, okay? And they lied to, to the apostles, they lied to the Holy Spirit, and they had to deal with it, right? They, they, they confronted them in love, and then the Holy Spirit kind of took it to a whole other level and dealt with it. But, but they were devoted in that partnership. Like, hey, we're going to be there for one another. And even in our low moments, we got we to gotta be there. we got to call one another higher. And then finally, what we just talked about with the, the appointment of the deacons there in 6 verses 1 through 7, they needed some organization and some structure, but they were devoted to that partnership. Let me ask you, how devoted to partnership are you? Is it a burden when people want to get together, want to get together and have a quiet time or pray or have a meal together? You know, is it a burden to come to, to meetings of the body? Or is it like, man, I, I'm devoted. That's my family. I'm going to be there. You know, in the church, our, our primary plan is as the church grows, you know, we like the feel of the this, this small, tight-knit family. But as the church grows, our family groups are so important. Because that's where a lot of real family happens, right? Those family group times, are you, are you devoted to those? When we're not meeting all together, but it's just your family group, are you devoted to your brothers and sisters? Brothers and sisters, I pray that in 2023, we can grow in our devotion to prayer and in our devotion to partnership. And one last area, devotion to preaching, okay? We see in, in the book of Acts, they were devoted to preaching God's word. Luke 24, verses 45 through 47, we see the Great Commission, right? Luke finishes up his book sharing the Great Commission of Jesus. Jesus said to go make disciples of all nations, right? That's what we see at the end of Luke. And then we see that lived out in the book of Acts. Um, again, I have the scripture references here for you, but I'll just share a few of these. In Acts 2, verse 40, it says, With many other words he warned them, and he pleaded with them, Save yourselves from this corrupt generation. Peter here, we see just his passion and his devotion to preaching God's word. Are we devoted to preaching God's word? In Acts 3, verse 16 and 20, I'll just read this to you. It says, By faith in the name of Jesus, this man you see and know was made strong. It is Jesus' name and, and the faith that comes through him that has completely healed him, as you all can see. Now, fellow Israelites, I know that you acted in ignorance, as did your leaders, but this is how God fulfilled what he had foretold through all the prophets, saying that the Messiah would suffer. Repent then and turn to God so that your sins may be wiped out and that times of refreshing may come from the Lord, and that he may send the Messiah who has been appointed for you, even Jesus. 
And again, this is just an example, but we see over and over and over. All these scriptures are examples in the first few chapters of Acts where they were preaching God's word. They were sharing the scriptures. In fact, many times they were being persecuted and they, they would get put in jail and then they'd get let go and then they'd be like, wait, aren't those the guys we just had in jail? They're out preaching again. I don't know about you, I've not been jailed recently for preaching, right? Hopefully that doesn't happen, but, but guys, we have no excuse. We have no reason not to be sharing God's word, to be devoted to preaching his word. We see these, these phrases day after day. They preach the word. They said, we cannot help speaking about what God has done. They said, we must obey God, not men. Others said about them, they never stop teaching and proclaiming the good news. Man, that is devotion. Are you devoted to preaching the word? It's not a thing for ministers to do. I mean, it is. I I need to do it too, right? But it's not a thing that only clergy does. It's not a thing that only, well, the family group leaders, they'll take care of that. This was something for every man and woman of God to preach the word. Are you passionate? Are you persistent? Well, I tried to share my faith one time and I got rejected, so I don't do that anymore. I'm not good at it. Man, I don't feel like I'm good at it at times, but I got to do it, right? Are you devoted to preaching the word? It's a command of Jesus. It's an expectation of God, not just something that would be nice. You know, I've heard the question asked before, why don't we see the church today grow like we see the church grow in the Bible? And I think maybe one of those answers is we're not devoted to preaching like we could be, okay? Not talking to anybody specific. I'm talking to all of us, right? As a, as a church, are we devoted to this? This is so important. You have the answers. You have the keys to salvation. Peter had the keys to the kingdom, but really we all have the keys. We have the word of God, but are we devoted to preaching it? You know, there's so much we can learn from the early church. We talked about earlier how each one of these sections in the book of Acts kind of has a summary scripture. Okay, let's read the summary scripture for what we've been looking at today. In Acts 6 verse 7, it says, So the word of God spread. The number of disciples in Jerusalem increased rapidly. Man, we see that the early church, when they taught what it meant to be a Christian, how to become a Christian, when they showed their devotion to prayer, to partnership, and to preaching, we see amazing things happen, and the word spread, and the church grew. Are you devoted? Do you know your scriptures? Do you know how to teach someone to become a disciple of Jesus. Brothers and sisters, I want to encourage us this morning. Let's, let's take a look, right? Let's take an inward look and say, okay, where am I at with these things? What do I need to grow in? What do I need to learn? And let's commit to doing it. And to God be the glory. Thank you. Oh.